in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. And he said, go, and it continues with the special call. I'm flipping over to Hebrews chapter 4 now, in the last three verses, starting with verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, thus hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And this is the word of God for the people of God. I was reading, it wasn't exactly a commentary, but it was comments about Isaiah chapter 6. And this uh, minister explained it with beautiful language. It just really caught my attention. But he did a little bit differently. He was describing step by step how Isaiah got up that day and went to the temple as in other days. And it describes actually how he gets to the temple, temple area. And he's looking at and listening to 250 Levites singing, some of them playing musical instruments, glorious worship at the temple. And the doors of the temple building itself were open and he looks inside. And then he sees what is described here in these first few verses. And I was caught by that. And I started thinking about that. And maybe that was really the way it happened. But then I thought, well, I've always considered to be a vision. It wasn't actually something that happened. And so I checked a couple other commentaries, and most of them, <laughs> seemed to agree that, yes, it was just a vision. He says he saw the Lord. And a, one specific thing that wouldn't have been part of a real fact that day, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne lifted up. There was no throne in the temple. You walked in and they had various instruments. And even behind the Holy of Holies, there was an altar where the seraphim were pictured, but it wasn't a throne. But if you didn't catch this, the very opening of Isaiah 6 says, in the year King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was on the throne 52 years. And he was a good king. You remember the description in the Kings and the Chronicles, how it would use that simple little description. He was a good king, followed after David. This was a wicked king. He followed the, the worshipers of Baal or whatever. But anyhow, didn't really give the details for most. It just simply said good or bad. King Uzziah was good, but he certainly wasn't perfect. 
In fact, in his later days, one of the problem things, the problems that we all have if we're pretty good folks. I'm looking at some pretty good folks, don't you think? <laughs> um, but not perfect. <laughs> Anybody here perfect? Raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, we'll know another problem that you have. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, King Uzziah was basically good, did a lot of good things. But toward the end, in his last few years, he got proud. Proud enough to do something that only priests were allowed to do. He went into the temple area, even into the area that was restricted for priests. <coughs> and because of that, God gave him leprosy for the remainder of his days. Now, I'm telling you this on purpose, not to shift subjects, but to show you a contrast between King Uzziah, who was good, and Isaiah, who was also good. But Uzziah, but Isaiah gets this vision, wasn't even in the temple, but he gets this vision of seeing the Lord, and he is so stunned, he cries out, Woe is me, I'm undone, for I have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Only the high priest could go behind the curtain, only once a year. And Isaiah had seen something that should be forbidden, very different from King Uzziah, who dared to go in. It's interesting when you think about Isaiah in this picture because uh, we wouldn't probably say after reading the entire book of Isaiah that Isaiah was, yeah, he was a pretty good guy like the rest of us. Oh, he was extraordinary, wasn't he? In fact, it looked like tradition says he died as a martyr. But the things that he said, we really don't know much about his life itself but just the things that he wrote down give us a picture of better than just pretty good. I mean, he seemed like among the purest, and yet he still sees his sin. Part of this is just coming to the communion table to realize that we come. You don't just say words of repentance. They'll be written out and so forth. But really search your heart like Isaiah and try to grasp the bigger, the deeper meanings Isaiah saw. In fact, his seeing, uh, I put down the three different ways that he saw. Uh, number one, he saw his unworthiness. I already mentioned that. Woe to me, I'm undone. Another version says, I'm unclean. Uh, just, maybe there's something true in this. Don't you agree with me that it seems like some of the people that are the purest, that seem more holy than anybody else, are also the most humble people before God in their prayers. Sometimes you hear people that you think, I wish I could get it. And then they start confessing and talking about how unworthy they are. That never occurred to me before, but as I was preparing for this sermon, I'm thinking, Isaiah 6, yeah, I kind of knew in the back of my mind, this seems to be Isaiah's conversion experience. Can't say that for certain, but it looks like something was radically changed in his life, in his heart, through this experience. But when he wrote the book with his name on it, it was after these events. And so looking back, in his very first chapter, he writes down, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Don't you think he's thinking about that personally and how he met God this day? And uh, God said the, the seraphim with a burning coal to touch his lips. Um, anyhow, he was sinful. He realized it. Second thing that he saw, God is near. The whole earth is full of his glory, he said. I'm letting you take that in a little bit because you could probably, you know, uh, Marie and Jody and Joni are probably enjoying some of that special glory because they're near the ocean now. Um, 
but we've all been different places. In fact, sometimes trying to put yourself to sleep at night, do you ever do this picture place where you were at on vacation and just kind of, man, that was beautiful. Let me, I have a couple of quotes about this. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, you've heard of her, about her and some of the things she wrote about love. Well, she wrote this that seems to fit here. She said, every common bush aflame with God, but only he sees who takes off his shoes. Wow, that says a lot, doesn't it? What's she meaning here? Uh, you have to have the right attitude because when God met with Moses and said, take off your shoes, it's holy ground, he fell before God and recognized him. A lot of people go through and look at those gorgeous ocean scenes and mountains and so forth and just think, wow, oh, amazing how this came from the Big Bang or whatever they're thinking. Um, but we in faith can recognize more. Another way of seeing I think about John Wesley and his journal, how he wrote on that period of time, maybe it was more than a day, but whatever, out in the Atlantic Ocean, on a ship, there's a bunch of Moravians on the ship. All of a sudden, the storm starts building up, and then it's raging, and it looks like they might go down. And John Wesley, supposed to be a follower, a believer, but quaking in his boots. And he noticed the Moravians over here kind of singing hymns, looking peaceful. He couldn't believe it. And that was what led him to that time when he went to a worship service um, later on and uh, said, my heart was strangely warm as he found genuine depth of faith. Anyhow, for us, the question is, how do we see him? Do we take off our shoes? Do we have peace like the Moravians? And I'm sure you do this sometimes, you especially that are connected with music. Um, when you're going through frustrating, anxious time, you find that song that, that spoke to you before and kind of go, what else did Isaiah see? He saw God transform him. The burning coal, the seraph takes the burning coal and touches his lips. And just the fact that it's God's grace that does it. He didn't just turn over a new leaf or reform himself, but he saw God do something, do something to forgive him. Uh, I'm going to go to, well, let me just uh, share this song that we often sing at communion time. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So it's the blood. And even though the burning coal represents God's act, uh, it is the cross, our symbol here, that uh, paid the price. Uh, this is from Hebrews, but it's in a different chapter than our reading. And it's kind of like if you picture Isaiah on other days when he would go to the temple, there is no record at all about him being a priest. So we undoubtedly never went to the area where the priests go. He could see inside of the Holy of Holies, or at least the holy place, sometimes when the doors were open, if he's standing in the court of, of the Jewish men. But uh, anyhow, different picture for us today. Listen to what the author of Hebrews says, and he writes to the Hebrews, to the Jews, people that were so used to the separation and this restriction and this huge curtain, but it was ripped in half. And the author of Hebrews writes, we have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. And now I'm gonna read a verse that I already read to you, but it's a different version because it has two words that I thought I'll share with you. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace and receive his mercy. We will find grace. As we come to the communion table, we don't have to fear, fall on our face like Isaiah, but we should in our hearts in the sense of repenting and really seeking the Lord because of what Jesus did. That's how we can come boldly. In fact, 
What did Jesus do? Isaiah, what did he, oh yeah, you wrote that. <laughs> Let me read that familiar passage that I often refer to at communion time. Isaiah 53, but I'm reading it in the New Living Translation just so you catch some words that are a little bit different. The suffering servant is the picture. And if you think about Isaiah writing this, probably seven or 800 years before it happened, it's amazing how detailed the picture is of Christ uh, suffering for us. Quote, rejected, despised, man of sorrows, wounded, bruised, pierced. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human. We turned our backs and looked the other way. He did not open his mouth, unjustly condemned, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Would you for a moment think about this one single word? It kind of caught me and did something to me, and I hope it does to you. Think about the word beyond. Now think about it in terms of communion. As we come and think about bread and the cup, don't just think about some grape juice and just that instrument. Think about the fullness of the meaning. Ask God to help you to take it in. And even as you pass the cross, think about what Jesus did for you. Think about your sin as we go through the, the time of repentance. Not just kind of like I'm better than the next guy, but okay, I'll go through this. But search your heart before a holy God. And so somebody wrote this. So let the light of the living Christ come upon you. Indeed, let it shine out through you. Like God said to Isaiah, go. But first, like I say, fall down before his throne, repenting, confessing, and trusting. Let's prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for what you did for us. What you did in the person of Jesus Christ, who not only came to this world, but went to the cross and went through all that suffering and died. But Lord, we thank you that he's alive today. Thank you for the hope that we have. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you look for a communion sheet? And uh, again, let me repeat, you are welcome to come to the Lord's table.